can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Morgan Tierney of RethinkIdeas.com. And Morgan, before I formally introduce you, I like to point out other episodes people should check out. Since this is part of the Top Agency series, I had two episodes with Jason Swank. Jason grew his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And then he actually has been buying up agencies. So we talk about the valuation process and what he looks for in that. Um, and then Todd Tasky also I had on, he has the Second Bite podcast. He talks about, he pairs private equity with agencies and helps sell agencies. And we talked again about valuation and in Second Bite, he calls it because sometimes the agency owner will make more on the Second Bite than they do on the first because they sell again uh, to private equity. So it's a really interesting journey. Uh, Kevin Hurrigan was another one from Spinia Tech. Um, he's had an agency since 1995, just to hear what it was like, the evolution, the pivots, the ups, the downs. So check that one out. Uh, many more on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their Dream 100 relationships. Uh, how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. Morgan, we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they can run their business, develop amazing relationships, and create great content. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. Uh, so if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Morgan Tierney. Uh, she's an executive creative director and partner at Rethink Communications in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and it was interesting, Morgan, about your journey. It's not the typical journey that I hear every day. Actually, <laughs> she started at Rethink as an intern in 2012. and progressed and is now a partner. That's so right. We'll, we'll talk about that journey. Rethink has worked on award-winning campaigns for brands, including Molson Coors, Ikea, A&W, Shaw Communications, Freedom Mobile, McCain Foods, many, 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 many more, which we will talk about. And Morgan, thanks for joining me. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Talk about, we'll, we'll talk about your journey from intern to here out, but just Start with Rethink Ideas and what you do. Sure, yeah. So Rethink is a full service ad agency. So we do everything from big broadcast campaigns to uh, digital. We do design, full service design agency, branding. Uh, and uh, we also have an in-house production wing called R&D Productions. So uh, we do it all and we do it with a focus on um, what we call acts, not ads. So we want to have brands doing things out in the world that get noticed and make those brands famous. And we have uh, been up and running since 1999, founded in, in Vancouver, Canada, by three founders, Chris Staples, Tom Schapansky, and Ian Grace. Uh, then expanded to Toronto in 2010, on to Montreal in 2014, and just most recently New York in uh, the past year. So really exciting time for growth uh, at Rethink. And we like to say on our website that uh, Rethink is an independent creative agency here to help you rethink. And that's a repeating cycle. So we uh, Rethink is really a one word business model where we are never satisfied with the status quo and we're always trying to rethink not just the work that we do, but the way that we do it. Love it. Talk about the original, I know you were going to talk a little bit about the origin story and what was the original idea of what um, companies or what purpose the company wanted to serve? Yeah, so Rethink was founded uh, when this little Vancouver creative shop called Palmer Jarvis uh, was acquired by one of the big agency holding companies. It was acquired by DDB. 
And when that acquisition happened, they went from being this little independent shop to being a wing of a global holding company. And they said nothing was going to change. And lo and behold, things did change. And the founders of Rethink, who were all at uh, Palmer Jarvis at the time, Chris, Tom, and Ian, uh, decided that it was time to go and start their own agency, uh, an independent agency that was founded on the principle that there was a better way to uh, to do advertising and to rethink everything about it, really. So that was how they aligned on the name Rethink. And it was really a commitment. They were even a little bit afraid to name the agency Rethink because that's drawing a line in the sand and saying, we're, go we're going to be disruptive. We're going to do things differently. And so uh, their their goal was really to try and take some of the chaos out of creativity because a lot of people think, oh, you know, creativity, it's it's got to be chaotic. It's got to be this this wacky, unwieldy, like off the rails machine. Uh, and and rethink was founded on the belief that you could apply structure and you could uh, pull some of the chaos out of the creative process and implement structures that allow creative people to thrive. So create an environment where, you know, ideas are championed and people are championed and where the process doesn't get in the way of the product. So just being able to um, give creative people the best possible chance at doing the best work of their careers. On that structure in creativity, right? You and the company talk about, I think there's 52 tools. <laughs> um, you know, there's a book called Rethink the Business of Creativity. You go through, oh, well, it's, and here it says 55 for the best tools. It's, a, it's a moving target. Who knows? Okay, whatever. You're probably <laughs> adding to it. But, um, over 50 uh, best tools. I'd love for you to talk through a couple of them. And this can be found on Amazon. If you're watching the, if you're listening to the audio, there's a video version of this, but um, we're looking at um, figure one publishing um, and the rethink the business of creativity. You could also find it on Amazon, um, but talk about some of those tools. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we published the book, Rethink the Business of Creativity, uh, in 20, well, actually our release date was, uh, what was that? It was, I think, was it March 13th, 2020? It was the day when everyone went home for two weeks and didn't come back for at least two a years. year. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three years and counting didn't come back fully. So we, uh, we decided to, uh, we, 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 you know, obviously canceled our launch party. So I think the, the publishing of the book kind of, uh, to, fell to the wayside because of COVID. But um, yeah, we took on this project in 2018 where we decided that we wanted to take everything that we learned over the course of the past 20 years at Rethink and encapsulate it all in this book. So uh, I drew the short straw and I was responsible for writing the first draft of the Rethink uh, book, which was about 30,000 words. And I remember at the time, it seemed like such a novelty because I decided to work from home to uh, work on the book. So I would, you know, I relish in the fact that I was at home working in my pajamas, working on this book and, oh, isn't this neat? You know, I can work from anywhere. Maybe I could, I could get used to this. It's pretty funny in retrospect, but um, uh, we did eventually publish uh, the book, which is this, this collection of tools. And Looking at it now, it's really a, uh, it's kind of a time capsule because everything has changed since 2020 when we published the book. Like everything has changed. So the way that we work, you know, hybrid remote working options, there's so much that has just completely been overhauled, even in the three years since we published the book. And uh, it reached the point where at one point, I was on a, a Zoom call with the whole staff, and I picked up a copy of the book, and I ripped a chapter out, and I set it on fire, and I threw it in my trash can, because the Rethink book is a working document. I can't stress that enough. So I, I'm happy to dive into uh, some of the tools in the book that are a little bit more of the timeless ones. Yeah, talk about those. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, one thing that... Uh, will always be true of working at Rethink or our philosophy around creativity is that the way to get to quality is through quantity. And there isn't really a way around that. If you want to get to a great idea, 
It could be your first idea or it could be your 100th idea, but you're not going to know which one it is until you've done all 100. So when we say that we cover the wall in ideas, we are dead serious about that. And you will see entire walls, everything that are made of corkboard or chalkboard that are absolutely covered top to bottom in ideas. Uh, so the one or 100 rule keeps us honest in terms of that desire to come up with the perfect idea right out of the gate and then revisiting that idea and realizing that you might not be there yet. You might be able to approve on it. There's always something else. And if you force yourself to go through the badlands in the middle of, you know, idea 56, idea 57, you're all the more likely to come up with some gold at the end. So we we do subscribe to the one or 100 rule. Um, another one that I think is important to highlight that may seem obvious um, is what we call the ping pong ball rule of communication. And this is the reason why, you know, we're that wacky creative agency where all of our boardroom tables are ping pong tables. There's a reason for that. And the reason is that if I throw you one ping pong ball, chances are you'll catch it. And if I throw you five ping pong balls, you'll probably miss all of them. And we like to believe that the same is true of creativity. So uh, whether we are writing a TV commercial or a radio ad or you know, a banner ad, we want to say one thing and we want to say it clearly. And we want to align on what that ping pong ball is for every piece of communication all the way down the funnel. Um, let's see, I could, I could talk about it a couple more here. Uh, we've got the, um, the shallow holes approach to presenting creative. So I'm sure a lot of people in your audience would relate to uh, being on the receiving end of a creative presentation. And the people being presented to are just as nervous as the people presenting. And then there's this terrifying reveal moment where it's like you've pulled the sheet off the idea and you've said, ta-da, this is it, we've solved it. And you have to say you like it because we've gone so deep on this idea already. And if you're not careful, that can be a recipe for disaster. You can waste weeks or months going deep on an idea that could have been killed in an instant early on if you'd just been less precious about the idea and let people into the kitchen a little bit earlier. So when we say shallow holes, thinking at Rethink, uh, we like to think of searching for great creative as um, imagine you're looking for gold on a beach. And it's really tempting to, you know, maybe you find a little bit of gold, you point, you you say, hey, there, X marks the spot. We're going to dig 10,000 feet deep right here. Uh, and then you, you've you taken a risk and you run the risk of hitting bedrock pretty early in the process. And you've gone deep too soon and you're going to end up in that ta-da moment with your client that can be really terrifying. So we believe in digging many shallow holes testing hunches, going six inches deep here, six inches deep there. And then our presentations are shaped around that. So we like to um, present, you know, instead of one big idea, you know, maybe it's five or six hunches. And things are a lot shallower, a lot faster and looser. It can be a pencil sketch on a page. We're really not precious about the format of our ideas because a great idea should be as clear on a cocktail napkin as it is in a hundred page deck. And we focus on ideas when we present with our clients and we, we train them to be primed to receive ideas and feedback on ideas. That way you don't get the feedback from the client. that's like, Oh, no, I don't like the color blue or, you know, uh, you, you lost me with the, the, the casting selection, or I didn't like the, uh, the line on the banner ad on slide 27. So it's allowed us to have a lot more productive first presentations and avoid that dreaded presentation where everything goes sideways and you're back to the drawing board and now you're four weeks behind. So I'm a firm believer in the power of shallow holes and the belief in sharing ideas earlier versus running the risk of having that terrifying moment down the line. How early do you first share those hunches with the client? I mean, it varies. There's a lot of clients who come to us and everything is a screaming emergency and they need it tomorrow. But a healthy creative timeline isn't days, it's weeks. And it takes that long to do the one or 100 exercise and to align on which shallow holes we want to bring forward because our process has a lot of um, peer review baked into it. When we say peer review, we mean 
sharing our ideas internally, not just with the creative department, but with people who represent the target. And, you know, honestly, like people who represent your mom out there in the world, walking around the people who are going to encounter these ads in the wild. And it really keeps us honest because too often in the advertising industry, you end up with industry people talking to industry people and losing track of the fact that these ads are meant to be experienced by people who have no context. So we'll run around the office with cork boards covered in ideas and share them with accounting and share them with IT and yeah, literally call up your mom and ask her uh, for her opinion. And then we take all the feedback we get from peer review through the process and we kind of, uh, we don't just automatically adopt it, we interrogate it. And we like to say that if someone says something once, you can ignore it. It might be a one-off. If they say something twice, you should at least think about it. And if they say, if something comes up three times, then you should probably act on it because it's going to be a recurring thing and it could create a big problem. So after we've gone through the entire process of ideation, office hours, check-ins with creative directors, peer review, refining shallow holes based on peer review, it's usually in the three to four, three to four week range to get to that gold. Morgan, are there any other timeless chapters or tools that stick out to you? I mean, I'm biased because as the person who wrote the draft, I feel very like, uh, can you hold up the book for a second? Emotionally invested. Yeah. So here's the book and each, uh, section or tool in the book is accompanied by a rethink designed uh, visual articulation of that idea because we are very visual thinkers. So some of these are chapters, if you're looking at the screen, so like the shared belief. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. What's this belief. What's this picture? <laughs> I mean, I think that picture... I don't is know if it's like a monkey yeah. eating a popsicle. What I don't know. Uh, so that is a logo that we designed for our own internal ping pong tournament oh, called, gotcha. King, called King Pong. And the reason that it's in the book is kind of twofold. One, uh, we entered our own internal logo for our internal ping pong tournament in award shows, and it performed surprisingly well. Uh, it actually picked up quite a few awards, that piece. And then uh, it's in the chapter of the book that is called One Plus One Equals Three, mm. which is really just one approach that we have for getting uh, two ideas. You'll see a couple other examples of One Plus One Equals Three where there's the audio symbol is also a UFO or mm. the cannabis symbol is combined with the Red Cross plus symbol to create a new wellness brand. So particularly in design, a one plus one equals three approach can be really effective at coming up with something new and fresh. So this is your logo, this ping pong paddle? Yeah. yeah. Well, Maybe this we should is sell logo. it to the pickleball yeah. companies now. Yeah. Oh yeah, and we've got a we've got a one plus one equals three pickleball idea that I can't tell you about right now. Mm. That's uh, TBD. So watch this space yeah. on uh, rethinkideas.com. But uh, yeah, this uh, flipping through the book right now just sends me down memory lane of uh, everything we've been through to get to these fifty two tools. Which um, I will say they're not all about developing creative. I look at them that way because I am a creative director writer by trade, but uh, the book is divided into three sections. So the first section is uh, sort of the people section, dealing with the people side of running a creative company. And there's some uh, you know tips and tricks in there. The second section is about that developing of the creative itself. It's more about the product that we produce. And then the third section is, I mean, we call it people, product, and profit. The third section is more about the... Um, the the founder's perspective on how to maximize the ROI of your creative company without, you know, burning people out or creating unnecessary red tape. Like one of the things that we did to um, remove some of that red tape that stops creatives from producing their best work was uh, eliminating timesheets. So a lot of creative companies think of what they're billing for as time. They think they're billing for creative hours spent on a project, but everyone lies on their timesheets. This is a known fact. Creatives are not out there working eight square hours a day or seven hours plus a lunch break and dividing it up all equally and saying, oh, you know, I spent 45 minutes on Molson here and then two hours on Ikea there. 
what's really happening is they're thinking about ideas when they're in the shower or while they're falling asleep or throughout the day. And it's just disingenuous. You're like, I build uh, yeah. 12 <laughs> yeah, midnight yeah, yeah. till 7 a.m. I was dreaming about this stuff. Yeah, so. exactly. That, that's seven minutes when I dreamed <laughs> about work last night. I'm going to call that an hour because, uh, you know, time dilation when you're dreaming happens. But uh, so we just decided to not play that game anymore. So we got rid of timesheets, which is a thing that makes life nicer for creatives. They don't have to worry about being nickeled and dimed on hours and they don't have to account for every minute that they're thinking about a brand. But it's just something that we trained our clients to accept was that we're not billing for time. We're billing for an output. And it just changed the way that we structure things. Talk about, Morgan, um, experiments, right? Because we were talking before we hit record you mentioned those things, no timesheets or some other experiments that you're always working on. What are some of those? Yeah, I think uh, we are always looking at ways to rethink, rethink. And because it is our one word business model, we like to interrogate, you know, what are things that we could be doing different from a process uh, standpoint that, again, makes life just that much more enjoyable and helps employees have, you know, maybe not work-life balance because long hours and weekends can be the nature of the beast in advertising, but work-life harmony, at least, and feeling like the work that you're working on is the type of work that you that you want to spend time on. So uh, one thing that we identified as a pain point in advertising is the Monday client presentation, which is just this, just this awful thing where the presentation gets shifted out from, let's say it was on a Friday, you ask for more time and account says, oh yeah, no problem. We can do it on Monday. Well, congratulations. You're now working the weekend because whether you say you are or not, it's going to be in, it's going to be in your head all weekend. That dreaded Monday meeting is looming and there's no reason for that. You can train your clients just like you train them to accept not billing for time. You can train them them to accept having the meeting on a Tuesday. So we came out with this loud and proud. We said no more Monday meetings. And we've been working really hard to make that, you know, a chiseled in stone, signed in blood reality. And I think so far it's been going really well. Our clients have all internalized the fact that Rethink is not available for their Monday morning presentation. There's virtually nothing, no advertising emergency serious enough that it can't wait until Tuesday. And it just allows teams to have that weekend, take that breath because a burned out creative isn't coming up with great ideas. They're doing whatever they can to stay afloat. And then they can come to the project with fresh eyes on a Monday and prepare for the Tuesday presentation. So we've we we launched that industry wide. We made a whole video uh, committing to it uh, that we played at the Strategy Magazine Awards last year in front of all of our peers. So they know that this is a thing at Rethink. Um, and we want to get other agencies to try and adopt that too. So a lot of the things that we experiment with and we try aren't intended to just be pure self promo for Rethink. They're intended to be opportunities for our industry to uh, to just do things differently and make life a little bit better, like I keep saying. So um, we know that it's not necessarily you know the the biggest ground shattering thing but uh having no meetings on a monday can uh you know make advertising just that little hair of a percentage uh better for people to work in um i think another one that i wanted to highlight uh under experiments is this thing that we did last year i know some of your other guests have talked about um having these sort of hackathon days or having these uh we have our own, of course, we branded it. We call it R&D Day for Rethink and Develop Day. So not the most groundbreaking thing to have a hackathon day per se, but there's this one idea that came out of our last R&D Day. And it was the idea of how our agency, for example, is closed uh, in the week between Christmas and New Year's. So sort of that, that magical liminal space week when time ceases to exist and a lot of our clients are closed and we're closed, but people don't necessarily have the opportunity to, to get out and live their best lives during that week off. It's sort of a recovery week between Christmas and New Year's when people are taking a breath. And we still have that, but we, out of our last R&D day, identified an opportunity, which was to take a week off in the summer too. And 
as much of an effort it is to close uh, close the agency and again, explain that to all of our clients, uh, it was something that we committed to and we called it Independence Week because we're an independent agency. Everything we will always be uh, independent. And that's something I'll talk about in a bit too, is we've actually committed to never selling, which is counterintuitive perhaps, but um, we've taken big steps towards ensuring that Rethink will never sell. So uh, we instituted Independence Week on the heels of this R&D day. It was the brainchild of a handful of Rethinkers from different departments. And rather than just say, hey, we're taking a week off in the summer, we decided to uh, reach out to other independent agencies and say, hey, you should do this too, because it's something that the big global holding companies are not going to want to do. Like they're beholden to their quarterly revenue numbers and they like I'm the creative, I'm ter- talking about numbers, but they are they're beholden to certain KPIs that do not allow them to just close for a week in the summer. And you know, if I'm wrong, I would encourage them to go ahead and celebrate Independence Week with us. But it's just another example of something that we've done to not only do self-promo and give our employees a break, but try to encourage other agencies to join in on as well. And it's something that we're really uh, excited to do every year because we did it this year and it was great. When there's no one to contact you when the agency's closed and you truly know that you can delete Slack off your phone and log out of your email and you're not going to miss any calls. No clients are going to bother you. No coworkers are going to bother you. It was a really much needed reset in what's usually our busiest time of the year, summer. So uh, just a couple examples of things that we're doing to try and rethink, rethink. What do you uh, remember, Morgan, is another fun example of what's come out of an R&D day? (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, every time we've done an R&D day, there's a bit of a different... How often do you do them? Usually once a year. I think What's we your... used to do them twice a year. We've been doing them for 10 years now. So... What's the format? How does it work? Yeah, the format of R&D day is we divide everyone at the agency up into teams from across departments. So usually you're with five or six people who you might not work with every day. And uh, then we have a some sort of a brief or an assignment. So we usually brief the week of our D day. So we'll let people know uh, what's coming. And we've had all kinds of different briefs. So the very first R and D day was a hackathon in its truest nature, where we were trying to come up with working prototypes of digital ideas in one day. So <laughs> every team had one poor suffering coder who was frantically typing up to the last minute. But we did come up with some working prototypes. Other briefs that we've had included what would like what would be an example? Oh, of an like example a of a prototype. Yeah. Uh, my team came up with a uh, I'm trying to remember. It was ten years ago, but uh, an app that was meant to be a habit tracker that distilled everything down to uh, one question asked to you once a day. So, keeping in mind this was 2013 or so, it's uh, definitely not revolutionary by today's standards. But we actually made this thing in a day. And we're able to step away and say, we made this app called Did You Blank Today? And it just is designed to ask you one question once a day. You track it and it gives you a color-coded numerical like visualization of that. So very simple. Uh, other teams did things like one team programmed a, uh, they made a robot office dog out of a Roomba <laughs> that day. So it was, uh, it was cameras linking the robot office dog in our office to the one in the Toronto office and the Montreal office. Uh, So year one was focused on working prototypes. Uh, Other themes that we've had include uh, one year the focus was all around content because it was right around that time when the amount of deliverables that we had to come up with were rapidly exponentially multiplying. So it was no longer you're making a TV commercial. It was your thing needs to work in every different YouTube format from six second to true view. It needs to work on a vertical screen, which was a whole new thing. Vine was popular at the time, I think. And TikTok was not yet a twinkle in anyone's eye. It was still still not a thing. Um, But Instagram video, GIFs were a thing. Um, So every team was assigned a different video format. And even podcast was one of the formats. And we aligned on a theme that everyone can make their video content around. And the theme was lunch, something that we're all familiar with. Uh, And every team had to go away and come up with their own piece of shareable content 
designed uh, to fit the specifications of a specific form of video or audio. Uh, so that was one year. That was a very fun, silly year. Some years are more fun and silly than others. And uh, other themes we've had included um, trying to come up with ideas that would solve problems in our cities and break through on a local news level. So this was in the early days of our Montreal office. So we were up to three offices at the time. And every office was jamming on ideas to try and come up with solutions for local problems. So in Montreal, for example, like road construction is a big issue. In uh, Toronto, I think it was, again, it came down to what you want for lunch. It was how you, de how you decide what you want for lunch was one of the team's ideas. And they came up with this thing where it was a rapidly changing uh, Instagram video and you just press your thumb on the screen to decide where you're going for lunch that day. Just like simple, uh, simple things you could do to solve problems in your city. And one that came out of the uh, Vancouver office was uh, the idea to, uh, instead of a rainbow crosswalk, to turn the entire Burrard Street Bridge into a big rainbow. And it was kind of positioned as this like, you know, this will never happen idea that was, you know, maybe just a little bit of a pie in the sky thing. But before we knew it, we had uh, CBC and CTV and all of these media outlets knocking on our door asking, is this real? How is this happening? Have you talked to the civic engineers? And next thing you knew, we were talking to the civic engineers. And uh, it didn't actually end up happening due to structural concerns with the bridge. But <laughs> right. just this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, R&D Day, it's, it's had all kinds of outputs. And we actually just had one. Uh, our most recent R&D Day was this past Friday. And uh, the focus was on ideas around um, uh, our, our, our Molson Coors beverage company partner clients. So we have a bunch of beverage clients who are hungry for breakthrough work. So we decided to throw all four offices, the whole agency at it, and just have a jam. And uh, it was also an opportunity for us to reinforce our commitment to peer review as part of the, the Rethink machine. So we called it Beer Review. And it was a day of blue sky thinking around all things beer and beverage related and then evaluating each other's ideas uh, using crafts, which is our acronym for the way that we uh, evaluate great creative. So how do you do that? So like, obviously, you start off in the morning, you break into groups, there's a theme, and then the, the groups just go at it and whatever that means. And then afterwards, <laughs> it sounds like you're doing a peer review. Um, and you mentioned crafts. What does that process look like? Exactly. So we actually created, uh, we used Google Forms to create a, a craft scoring system where each idea on our Indeed could be ranked according to a letter. So the C is for clear. Your idea has to be clear above all. Otherwise, none of the other scores matter. Uh, it has to be relevant, meaning there needs to be a reason to do this idea now at this time in this place. People need to have a reason to want to talk about this idea. It needs to be achievable, meaning you can't, you know, produce a $2 million idea on a $10,000 budget. Um, and we actually had like a fairly healthy budget set aside to potentially produce some of these ideas. So the A in crafts is achievability, which keeps us honest. Uh, and then the F is for fresh. So basically, if it's been done, it's dead. And uh, you have to do a deep dive on Google and dig into that advertising brain and ask yourself if you've seen this anywhere before and ask other people if you've seen it anywhere before, because there's no feeling worse than selling an idea and realizing it's been done and having to unsell it. So uh, uh, the F is for fresh and the T is for true. Uh, there needs to be an underlying truth to your idea. If something scores high on truth, then chances are your reaction is something like, oh, wow, that's so true. I never thought of it that way. And on the other end of the scale, if your idea isn't scoring high on T, it's more of like, oh, this is advertising BS and I am being like sold a bill of goods or these brands are trying to manipulate me. Um, and then finally, the S stands for shareable. So if your idea scores highly on relevancy and freshness and truth, then chances are it's going to be a highly shareable idea. And we also like to make sure that our ideas have a thing that is shareable, whether that's a catchy name, a catchy tagline or headline or uh, a press headline. So how are the media going to talk about this idea? And 
shareable is really just our way of saying, if we succeed and we make this thing, are people going to care? And not just in our industry, are people going to want to share this work around? Uh, is it going to get buzz? Is it going to get earned media? And that is always a goal for, for our clients who often have more modest uh, budgets is how do we get earned media on this thing? So one of our uh, like best client relationships is with the YWCA uh, here in Canada. And obviously a not-for-profit doesn't always have the biggest media budget. So we have to really try to dig deep and come up with work that's going to break through for them. What'd you do with the YWCA? Uh, we've done a few things for them in the last year that we're feeling uh, really good about. So one was this initiative called Add the M. And it was a uh, a realization that sports logos like the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, they they don't have the W in them, but the N, the WNBA does. So we added the M. We got our graphic designers to modify the logos to the professional sports leagues, and we created logos for the MMLS, the MNHL, the MNBA, the MMLB, because why not? And then we got a bunch of uh, influencers from uh, various sports leagues, men's and women's sports leagues, to uh, say it's time to add the M uh, for, for equity in sport. So that was a really popular uh, piece for the YWCA that got a lot of uh, media attention, obviously. That, for, that, for me, yeah. <laughs> when we look, think of the crafts, right, mm -hmm. it makes me think of the T, right? It's oh, that's so oh, true. That's so true, right? Wow, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's something we don't even think. I, I could speak for myself. I don't even think about with it's the MBA, right? But it's the WMBA, but it's not the MMBA. Oh, so MMBA. so true. Yeah, so true, right? And then that makes it shareable, and it also has a little bit of tension baked into it, where you know there might be a reaction to someone seeing the MNBA logo and saying, "Oh, whoa, you can't you can't change my beloved sports team's logo." And that's why we like to say there's no attention without tension. And if your idea doesn't have an underlying strategic tension baked into it, then again, it might not get shared. It might fall on deaf ears. So we we're very proud of that work for YWCA. Do you um, remember any of the creative process in coming up with this? Because like it seems so obvious now, like when you say it, but it's not easy to come up with this. What are some of the breakthroughs you had with the creative process here? Yeah. So this process was we had teams across the country in Vancouver, Toronto, and possibly New York. I'm not sure if New York was up and running yet at the time, but we had teams working on this women's empowerment sort of one pager brief about what can we do in the space of um, women's empowerment in sports because uh, we have a few different clients who have appetite for those types of ideas. So the thinking that led to Add the M was, uh, was sort of on an open brief. It was a cause that we're passionate about, and we do a lot of work for causes that we're passionate about. And sometimes we'll come up with an idea and just ask ourselves, which client is brave enough to do this thing? Like, come up with the crazy idea first, then mm. reach out to the client, because then you're not constrained by you know, all of the deliverables and mandatories of the brief and you, you're you free to think more creatively. So in that, I love instance, that. Yeah, yeah, we came up with the idea. And, and then it's, it's kind of interesting, Morgan, <laughs> because it's like, listen, if you don't take this, we're going to this other company. They're probably <laughs> going to take it. It's going to blow up. So yeah, you want and, and it I, or not. So there's some lying. this competitive I, nature in there too. Yeah, I'd be lying if I said that doesn't happen. Um, and thankfully, we have such a great relationship with the YWCA that they got first right of refusal, I love refusal it. if you will, and they snapped it up. But Such uh, a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, that was a big win. Even though when we came up with that idea, I remember seeing it from a creative team on the slide, and my immediate reaction was, "Oh, that's not achievable. We can never do that." I was like, "We'll we'll get slapped with a cease and desist in the first day from the NHL or NBA." But uh, sometimes you just we like to say, "Go then grow. Just do the thing and see what the reaction is." And obviously mitigate risk as much as you can. But if you start small and see if your little minimum viable product idea has legs, then once momentum starts to grow, it can really snowball fast. How do you 
you know, decide on the influencers here. Um, obviously, if you're watching the video, you can you can see I have the page up. You can check all these out, by the way, on rethinkideas.com and go to the work page. And, and I'm on this right now, which is the um, YWCA. But how do you then determine? Now you've come up with the idea. Now you have another step to cr produce a creative and have the uh, influencers or talent. So yeah, how'd so you come up, up with these? Coming up with the idea is actually just one, the first step in quite a process where we like to think of ourselves as sort of the shepherds of ideas. You come up with your idea and then you have to sort of protect it and shepherd it through every step of the production process all the way down the line. And we're control freaks at Rethink. So we uh, we wanted to optimize our influencer uh, process. And we actually created a new department called Brand Narrative. So it's kind of like a PR department. We used to call it amplification, but basically it's a department that takes our little germ of an idea and tries to maximize how far we can amplify it, who we should work with, vets influencers, brings people on board, handles a lot of that back end behind finding those people because it can definitely be a very time consuming process. And who you hear a message from is just as important as what the message is. So if we have an idea, then it's often uh, a shared responsibility of the creatives and the brand narrative team to bring it to life in the world. Um, I want to talk about another example, but which is your, I know it's it's hard to choose between your favorite children. And I'll tell you which my personal favorite was after watching. I mean, there's so many good ones, so it's hard to it's hard to choose. But um any guesses on what you think I was gonna say on uh I said before we we hit record here, um, which was my favorite. Mm, and well, granted, I didn't watch every single one of these, so in fairness, but but one stuck out to me for some reason. Okay, I'm going to talk about two examples just because they're top of mind recent memory because I can't, like you said, it's hard to choose children. But two projects where if if I run into someone at a party and they ask me, oh, what, do you, what are you proud of that you've worked on recently? Um, there's a couple projects that I want to point to. And ironically, they're both books. Like I already talked about a book for the first third of this, but there's two book related projects. One is called The Unburnable Book. And that was a project where we uh, noticed the trend of, unfortunately, book burnings back and happening in America and people saying that books, certain books shouldn't be on the shelves. So we created an unburnable book and we worked mm -hmm. with Penguin Publishing uh, to create the, the world's first book that could withstand a bonfire. And we actually got the opportunity to work with Margaret Atwood and have her blast this book with a flamethrower uh, on camera to announce the launch of the Unburnable book. So she shoots a flamethrower at uh, a copy of The Handmaid's Tale, which was then auctioned off at Sotheby's in New York and uh, made a big splash. And we were very proud of that book. But another book that we're proud of is uh, that's near and dear to my heart because as a good Canadian kid, I grew up playing hockey. I'm a hockey goalie is uh, this project that we did for Scotiabank called the Hockey Jersey. So if you're a little bit of background for the uh, non-Canadians, but if you're Canadian, you grew up with this book called The Hockey Sweater. It was a children's book about a kid who moves to a new town and doesn't have the same hockey jersey and all the other kids are cheering for the other team and it's heartwarming. We grew up with it. Um, but there's no diversity in that book. And so we decided to work with Scotiabank, who's one of the big five banks in Canada, one of our clients, to develop a version of the book called The Hockey Jersey that uh, was updated for the modern generation. So we published this book. We worked with uh, an amazing illustrator, an amazing author, and created this book that is a real thing in the real world that has actually reached out to and spoken to a lot of underrepresented kids in a sport that is still overwhelmingly not diverse. So um, we were really proud to work with Scotiabank on a project that feels like it's genuinely doing good and reaching kids and helping to make everyone feel accepted in, in the hockey world. So a little bit of a passion project for me. I so promise I make other things besides books. One of my favorites, um, Morgan, is, is this one. 
Um, oh yeah. <laughs> the law firm lifesaver. I, mm -hmm. I thought this one was hilarious. Uh, you could check it out. I, you know, if you're thinking of getting, how do you get creative ideas for yourself, your business, your team, whatever, I suggest going to rethinkideas.com and looking at some of their work because they've put probably a tremendous amount of hours and time and energy into this. And, and I thought this was hilarious. And um, one, maybe it's seeing lawyers underwater. Maybe that was the funny <laughs> part, but um, it's about for with Cleo and it's so funny. Um, and it's again, kind of in the crafts. So true. Right. And, and how you illustrated this through treading water and being busy. And then I don't know if you came up with this ahead of time and then Cleo took it on, but I could see a lot of businesses being like, yeah, I, I want that, right? There's a, there's a, obviously a life preserver. That's the software um, saving them, but it's just funny to see how you illustrate that with treading water and then the software itself. Um, and then, you, you know, the law firm lifesaver. So. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought this one up because it is one of those little like bright spots in in my career where we had this brief come across our desk. This was this is a real client brief where Cleo. I mean, filming her. this has got to be yeah. hilarious. Oh yeah, like, this was a night. This was a night shoot in a swimming pool with divers in scuba gear there's, underwater. There's a fax yeah. machine and yeah, printer was, in the pool. Oh yeah. yeah, this was this was producers said it couldn't be done, but it turns out you just put the fax machine in the pool and <laughs> uh, figure it out. So so this one came to us as this sort of B two B brief that was you know I saw it and I was like ooh software for law firms is this something that is going to be conducive to great creative? And the more we talked about it, the more excited about it we got because we realized that there is this clear insight around how it can feel like you're drowning if you're working at a law firm. And a uh, passion project for me too, because before I worked in advertising, I was working as a legal secretary. So I saw firsthand the, the reams of paper, the rooms full of bankers boxes, full of binders, and how for a lot of small law firms, lawyers just want to help people. Like lawyers aren't necessarily the boogeyman. They're there are a lot of these small firms who just need to clear out all that paperwork and have a, a solution that can help them not tread water anymore. So this was an example of as soon as we had that idea and we landed on the law firm Lifesaver, we were off to the races and we were looking at swimming pools and we were yeah booking, booking the dive team and designing the uh, inflatable inner tubes that represent the software, casting the, uh, the spokesperson, the Clio Lifesaver lifeguard. And yeah, that one for me is just a real bright spot, even if it was an all night night shoot at a swimming pool in Ontario. <laughs> you know, I know we have a few minutes and I really want to hear your path and journey. Can you take me through just intern and, and just the pathway you took to partner? Yeah, uh, definitely. I'll, I'll give you the, the Coles notes on that. But so my background isn't in advertising. I graduated with a psychology degree in 2008, which if you might remember, that's that's a pretty big global recession that was going on at the time. So I took uh, whatever jobs I could get. I took temping jobs. I worked all over the place. I had a, a theater background, which wasn't the most useful for me, but it, it taught me that I really enjoy writing and I really enjoy making things and creativity. But because of the recession, I ended up working uh, as a government legal secretary, the most buttoned down environment that I could imagine, and spending my days photocopying, collating, phoning witnesses, you know, flipping through really dry material, and lots of time to think about what I wanted to do with my life. So when the time came, uh, I found out I was going to get put on this really grisly file that was all about, uh, you know, uh, abuse of sled dogs. It was really dark stuff. And I was like, I can't I can't work as a legal secretary anymore. This is not the kind of thing I want to be reading around about all day. So I knew it was time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I just decided, hey, you know, I like writing but I almost never finish anything longer than a minute. So maybe advertising, you know, I was the kid who watched all the commercials. I've been absorbing it my whole life. It's in there somewhere. Uh, so I went back to school. I did a post-grad certificate and the first agency I applied for, uh, for my internship was Rethink. I saw they had a Vancouver office. I knew they had a great reputation. I liked that they were sort of this disruptor agency that was growing. And, uh, 
So I did my internship at Rethink and we happened to get a, a really significant new client, which was Shaw Communications while I was doing my internship. So I got to have that magic moment where uh, the founder of the company is celebrating a client win and goes, hire the interns, right? So uh, from that moment on, I was just really thrown into the deep end. Um, I think I produced 12 TV spots in my first year, which is insane. It was really just, you know, in the spirit of Clio being thrown into the deep end. And uh, it was it was sink or swim. And I think just consistently, you learn to trust that your brain can solve problems, can always come up with more ideas, can do the one or 100 thing. And over time, I got, uh, you know, promoted through the ranks, like creative director, partner, and now executive creative director in the Vancouver office. And I'm leading the biggest creative department in Vancouver, along with my uh, my creative partner, Leah Rogers. So uh, it's been uh, the founder of the company, Chris Staples, who has a great way with words, once said, uh, you want to promote from within. You want to take a little puppy and raise it and train it and then tie it to a rocket ship and light a match. And uh, I, I really do truly feel like that sums up my experience at Rethink, where it has been like being on this rocket ship, going from this agency that had, you know, 50 people in Vancouver and a handful in Toronto when I started and seeing this explosive growth that's happened through Montreal, now into New York and beyond to the point where we're not really thinking about Rethink as a Canadian agency anymore. We see ourselves as an international player and, you know, we want to be that number one independent agency in the world. So we're dreaming big and the phone is ringing. And yes, you go through some growing pains along the way, but I really do feel like now is the most exciting time ever to be at Rethink and the work that we're doing is the best ever. And we just want to keep raising the bar for, you know, not just advertising agencies. Again, we're just thinking bigger. We want to raise the bar for all creative companies and have, you know, help others in our industry do the best work of their careers. Morgan, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing the ideas, the journey, the book, and your work. Everyone check out RethinkIdeas.com. And Morgan, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.